Hello, everyone, and welcome to week three of the virtual admitted students programming. Thank you all so much to all of our admitted students for keeping up with all the programming that we've been doing throughout the month of April. For our first session today, we have Trisha Morgan and Benjamin Shaw, who are going to share with us today about the Community Engagement Center and all of the amazing work that they do to keep up with our social responsibility core value here at Pitzer College. So take it away, Trisha and Benjamin. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, my name is Trisha Morgan. I am the Managing Director of the Community Engagement Center here at Pitzer. I have been here for about 15 years. That includes time as a student and also now time as um, a staff member and being a part of the Community Engagement Center for so many years. Um, so I am really, really excited to chat with all of you and to share with you a little bit about our center. Um, as Kayla mentioned, we also have a student with us. He is Benjamin Shaw. He coordinates the People's Pitzer, which is our civic engagement programming. And you'll be able to hear a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen first and get us started here. All right, so uh, let me just hide my little controls here. So we are, like I said, the Community Engagement Center, and I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about us and the role that we play at Pitzer. So for those of you that aren't aware, there is a graduation requirement for all students at Pitzer. You need to take uh, one of each of these courses, a social justice theory course, a social responsibility praxis course. There are some additional other courses that you'll need to take, such is intercultural understanding local. That's another one that's really closely related to our office. Um, but really today we're going to talk mostly about the social responsibility praxis courses. So you may be wondering what is praxis? What is that word? What does it mean? Um, praxis is really about a cyclical relationship between theory, action, and reflection. So the idea is that students will take theory either that they've learned in their courses or from their own lived experiences. They'll apply those to actions that they'll take and community engagement that they'll be involved in with partners during their time at Pitzer. And then they'll reflect on you know, how that experience, how those actions played out, whether or not they um, affirm or uh, contest the existing theories. And this cyclical relationship is really a big part of how students will learn at Pitzer and particularly related to community engagement. So the way that we do community engagement at Pitzer is, um, you know, a little different than you might experience at other schools. So, you know, we are really looking more at a social justice model. Um, this is, you know, centered, centering the community's experiences, um, their needs, their desires, their assets, um, everything that they bring to the table. We're really trying to leverage our human and material resources here at the college to be in partnership with community members, um, to work toward social change, you know, with them um, rather than for them. And the ways that we do this take place um, in a lot of uh, different settings and a lot of different activities that students will get involved in. A lot of times these will be related to social responsibility praxis courses that students are enrolled in. Again, that's one of those types of courses that they need to take to graduate. Those classes are available in just about every discipline. Um, these classes um, explore a variety of, of issues and current events, um, things that are going on, and they partner with community-based organizations to do a variety of work. So we have five kind of pillars that sort of um, house the different types of activities that are happening at Pitzer. Um, these can happen again through those courses or if students are just want to be volunteers, we have a variety of internships and fellowships and other opportunities uh, for students to get involved if it's not through a course. Um, so the pillars of engagement that we have are related to education, mentoring and college access. I think that one kind of, you know, uh, speaks for itself. We do tutoring and other things related to that pillar. We also have a direct uh, action and community organizing pillar. In this area, students work on issues that are related to um, boycotts, petitions, phone banking, um, protest safety, legal support, um, leadership development, all different types of, of things there. We also have social media and communications pillar. In this pillar, you might be working with a community partner um, to create a podcast, 
uh, to share information about the history of, or the development of their organization, ways that people can get involved. Um, and you might see uh, students working together with community partners and faculty and classes, developing websites or social media content um, and accounts, things like that. We have another pillar that's related to research and grant writing. So this is a big part of how we leverage our human and material resources at the college. Um, students are available and faculty are available to, to um, you know, do greater in-depth research that maybe partners may not have access to the resources that we have, our libraries, um, time and energy, all different types of, of reasons why this support is so important. These reports can be used in a variety of ways. They might help um, support social changes or legislation related to impacted populations, or this writing might be go on to help support um, the securing of grants that can then go on to support community partners partners in really important ways. And lastly, we have the People's Pitzer. This is our civic engagement component. I won't speak too much about that because I want to give Benjamin time to talk about that uh, later when we're done. Um, another important part of what CEC does is that we provide support and resources for students as well as faculty, but here today I'm just going to talk about what we do for students. Um, normally when we do in-person engagement, right now everything's remote because of the pandemic, but we are going to be looking to transition um, back to in-person engagement this coming school year. We offer students up to $100 per student per semester just for transportation or mileage related costs to get to and from your community partner sites. We also have vans or other transportation assistance that we can provide. We pay 100% for student clearance if they need to get um, a TB test or um, a background check or a live scan process done to work with, say, a protected population, someone who's incarcerated, a minor, um, someone with disabilities, um, elderly populations. We'll pay for all of that 100%. We'll help you figure out which community partner to work with. If you have an existing community partner, Partner, we will work with you and support that as well. Um, we also do training and development for students. We have awards and jobs, like I said, fellowships, internships, um, both postgraduate, or I'm sorry, post um, undergrad and also during their undergrad time. And these things all come together during your Pitzer time as students because this is going to contribute towards student growth and the application of critically important critical thinking skills. So students will develop an understanding of social responsibility and the ethical implications of knowledge and action. This is part of the graduation requirement. Um, they'll learn community-based problem-solving skills, gain that intercultural understanding. They may be working with a community that's very similar to their own back home. They may be working with a community that's very different to their own back home. So they'll learn a lot just through that experience, um, as well as being able to provide you know, uh, or develop critical thinking skills in real world settings and apply those. Um, again, this is really important in a reciprocity model where, you know, community partners are having a need met by our students and by the partnership with the college. And uh, conversely, students are learning a lot throughout the entire process. And, you know, why is this really important um, for students in particular? You know, these are activities that, according to research from the California Campus Compact and the broader National Campus Compact, as well as the American Association of Colleges and Universities, shows that students who do community engagement during their college time experienced increased self-confidence and self-efficacy. Um, they feel more socially integrated within the campus community. They feel less isolated. They have a greater sense of purpose and self-awareness. They're also more likely to per persist toward their degree and matriculate within four years. So this is important, not just for you know, what the student is able to give back to the community, but it's also really important because it helps with their own personal development and it decreases, you know, feelings of depression and anxiety. And um, that's really important to attend to, you know, well-being as well. 
And so I'm just going to leave our contact information here. Um, that email address, the CEC underscore staff at pitzer.edu, will go to our entire staff. You can also look us up individually, like on the CEC website, and see you know each of our areas of, of expertise and how to get in touch with us. But if you're not sure who to reach, you can just email CEC underscore staff. Um, and all of us will get the message, and whoever is the most appropriate will be the one to respond. Fund. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop now. Um, go ahead and hold any questions that you might have or submit those through the chat. Um, but I'm going to turn it over next to Benjamin and then we'll open up um, the Q&A portion after that. So I'm going to stop sharing now and take it away, Benjamin. Great. Thanks so much, Tricia. Um, yeah, as was mentioned, my name is Benjamin. I am a first year at Pitzer and I am working as part of the CEC uh, as the student coordinator for the People's Pitzer which is just one of a number of programs that's being organized by the CEC um, to foster community engagement and to sort of work on these different initiatives. Our focus primarily is on civic engagement and on what that means in regards to the community and the work that we can do. Unsurprisingly, uh, last semester, we focused on the 2020 election cycle and did a lot of work with voter education, with voter outreach. We had a really strong and dedicated group of students that was interested in that kind of work, um, working with ballot access in different states, and were able to host a number of events. And that was actually our first semester of having the People's Pitzer. Since then, we've grown to include um, more students and working more directly with student groups. And so a lot of the work that we do is on connecting with community partners regarding what civic action means um, as a form of popular action and of community action and how popular movements can use civic activism as a way to make change. So whether that means um, petitioning the government, whether that means legal action, whether that means working through specifically civic channels, um, we're exploring those intersections and showing how that work can actually be a tool useful for creating community change. Other uh, events that we've hosted include a speaker series with community activists, um, including members from different climate action groups, elected representatives, uh, police abolitionists. We've also been able to provide reimbursements for um, gas mileage used to go to voting locations or to community uh, organizing events or city council meetings. And we've worked really closely with a number of partners, um, both at a national level and at a really local level, including other student groups, to coordinate different initiatives and different ways to reach out and to be able to educate Moving forward, we're really looking forward to being able to be on campus and be together so that we can continue this work outside of the digital space that we've been so accustomed to and that we've sort of grown the organization in. Um, and so having that opportunity, we're excited to grow even more and see what new students can bring to help us out. I will uh, pass it back over to Tricia now, and we're happy to open it up to Q&A too, so feel free to put those uh, in the chat. Yeah, so that was basically all that we had to present to everybody. Um, really, really open to um, supporting existing community partnerships or existing community engagement that students do. Um, you don't have to come to Pitzer and start a brand new thing if you've been doing something for a long time. We want to support that work and honor the work that you've been doing already. Um, so feel free to ask us any questions um, about any of the pillars of engagement that we have. Um, we can also discuss some of the community partnerships that we have. We work with a number of schools, um, a number of nonprofit organizations. Um, we are looking at expanding into arts-based activism and supporting that work. Um, coming into this, this new school year, we're really excited about that, but um, things are being developed. So, um, can't tell you more than that right now, but we're really excited about those opportunities um, and making sure that we value our community partners and everything that they teach Pitzer students and faculty and staff. They, they teach all of us so much. Um, and it's really an honor to be able to work in a place where we're able to give back to them regularly. So thank you so much. Okay, looks like there's a question. Um, what are common organizations or community partnerships that students partner with? So we have several. Um, 
One organization in particular um, we have had is um, the city of Pomona has invited us to participate in their um, COVID action committee that they have. So they have a number of um, different branches within that, that committee. It's convened by the mayor of the city of Pomona, which for those of you who aren't aware is a, a local city to the colleges. Um, on that committee, they discuss things related to um, college and educational access, uh, basic needs support, um, supporting and um, economic development within the city, supporting small businesses, making sure that the vaccine rollout is happening that people know um, where to get it, how to get it, um, combat misinformation that may be out in the community. Um, that's one particular partner that we work with. We work with another organization um, called the Pomona Library Foundation. They work with the Pomona Unified School District, providing tutoring and support services for families. Um, year round, they do um, field trips, they do tutoring, mentoring, um, all kinds of different support and, and things going on there. We're also partnered with Huerta del Valle. Another local city is the city of Ontario. That's actually my hometown. Um, and Huerta del Valle is a community garden. Um, it's one location. They have like maybe six or seven different locations all around that specialize in different um different areas of expertise. They have a farmer training program. Um, people in the local area are allowed to have um, a, a plot of land. They get trained. They can um, sell the things that they grow there at farmer's markets and things like that. Um, they also have like workshops that for you know, like, um, you know, nutritional workshops and um, reading programs for kids and all different kinds of things related to that. Um, we are looking at partnering with um, the uh, Pomona Laureate, uh, I'm sorry, the Poet Laureate for the city of Pomona. Um, his name is David Judah Oliver. We're looking at doing some programming, um, arts related and spoken word programming um, with them coming up. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of other things, but I see that there's more questions in the chat. You can also find um, partner profiles on our website by looking up the um, CEC webpage of part of the Pitzer website, and you can see all of our partner profiles. I saw another um, a question about um, Co the CASA program, if we could talk a little bit more about the CASA program. So CASA is a separate program for from the Community Engagement Center. It stands for Critical Action and Social Advocacy. It is located also in the city of Ontario. It's an academic program. So students that participate or are enrolled in CASA will usually take um, two classes. I believe it counts for three course credits. And they do a, a really intensive internship experience in the, in the community with CASA partners. Um, we overlap a little bit with some of the CASA partners. Some are totally separate. Um, but students who take that class will be really um, exploring in-depth community-based research methods and approaches and you'll do about 100 hours in a semester um, just working in that program and with your community partner and it'll result in like a culminating kind of event or presentation at the end where students turn their research or their projects over to their community partners that they've been working on these projects with. Um, so that's a little bit about CASA. Um, you can get in touch with them by emailing uh, Jessica underscore Cherez and Cherez is C-H-A-I-R-E-Z. Uh, so Jessica underscore Cherez at pitzer.edu. She's the program coordinator or program admin for CASA and she can give you more information about that specific program. Um, it looks like another question we have, are there community-based organizations that involve working with children? I currently work with toddlers as a childcare provider and would like to continue to do similar work in college. Great question. Yes, there is a program for that. There is a, um, a seven C or I'm sorry, it's a five C uh, program. So it's intercollegiate, it's called Jumpstart. It's part of AmeriCorps um, and it's an early childhood literacy program. Um, you probably are aware of that working in childcare, um, but they do really excellent work. And the work that they've been doing has been shown to decrease 
um, gaps in, in um, achievement gaps. So uh, the work that they've been doing is really awesome. You get to work with young kid, young preschoolers and their families, um, singing songs, reading books, playing games, um, you know, doing all kinds of really cool stuff. So that's a great program. If you have uh, questions about that one, you can email Janessa underscore Flores underscore Parker and Janessa is J-E-N-E-S-S-A. Um, so Janessa underscore Flores underscore Parker at pitzer.edu. And she's the program coordinator for Jumpstart. It is part of CEC. Um, and you can get in touch with her if you have more questions. In addition to Jumpstart, there's also other uh, programs. So we work with Prototypes Women's Center, um, which is located in Pomona. They also have their a women's recovery program and they have, um, you know, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like uh, in I'm sorry, they have inpatient um, clients who stay there. They're women who stay there with their children up until I think like age um, eight or nine, I think. And so children under that age live there with their moms and they also have um, childcare center there and needs so that while the moms are doing their programming or when they're out working or um, doing whatever they need to be doing, then they also have people there helping take care of the kids. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have tutoring and mentoring programs with Pomona Unified School District students, particularly, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly elementary school students. Um, okay, can you talk about, um, okay, we already talked a little bit about the community partners, so I think that one has been answered. Um, uh, you have existing relationships. Um, are there ways with community organizations in your own city? Are there ways for Pitzer to support or meet um, requirements through our own communities? Yes, absolutely. I love that question. Um, one thing that the pandemic has shown us over this last year is that it's absolutely possible to do remote work. So if you live in a place that's not local to the campus, you can continue to do remote community engagement work um, in order for it to count for something that will be part of your graduation requirement, you do have to take one of the social responsibility praxis courses um, that are designated through the registrar. You'll be able to see it when you look for your classes. You'll be able to see which ones are praxis courses. We also call them SRX courses. Um, you'll have to work out with your professor. So, you know, where your community engagement will take place for that class. So if it's a class that's really related to something completely different than your community partnership site, it may be unlikely that you'll be able to, you know, use that partner site. But I highly recommend getting in touch with the faculty. Our faculty are amazing. They are so understanding and really flexible and they really value good community engagement work as well. So you may be able to just work it out with a faculty member that that's what you wanna do. That's where you're gonna go for their class and they'll totally okay it. So you just kind of have to read the course descriptions and then talk to the faculty members to know for sure. Um, <clears throat> Yes, I would love to hear more of Benjamin talking and less of me. So Benjamin, can you talk a little bit about like just your role in the CEC and like what kinds of things that you personally do to like make the people's pits are happen? Um, and if you know of any, like, I think you know the other student jobs in our office too, if you wanna talk a little bit about those um, and I can always jump in with anything that you might miss. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think in that presentation, we sort of outlined the different pillars of the CEC, which include the People's Pitzer for civic engagement, and then there's also direct action, there's social media actions, a couple of other um, focuses that we have in initiatives. And so my role as a student is as the head of one of those pillars, and we have a team of students, each one who's taking on one of those. Um, we also have students that are working within the administration of Pitzer for racial justice, um, my role primarily has been in terms of organization and growing the organization uh, and initiative because it is so new. So we do a lot of hosting events, we do outreach, we do um, running social media channels. It's a lot of interfacing with community partners to work on promoting their events as well. Um, and a lot of times student leaders will serve as stand-ins for organizations that need the extra set of hands or the extra pair of eyes. Um, so we've worked in the past with uh, tutoring for citizenship exams. Um, if you're working with a group of immigrants with uh, English as a second language, 
uh, and just being there for technical support. We do different events of that sort of nature with community partners. Um, and then each one of these initiatives has sort of a different role with that. So some of them are more focused on community outreach. Some of them are more focused on internal change within the administration and leadership trainings. Um, and some of them are focused really on direct action and connecting students directly to community partners that they want to get involved in or that need the assistance. In terms of other student positions, there are a ton of volunteer and internship positions. There's also things that students design themselves. Um, there are club leaders that work really closely with us. We have a couple of partners that are doing incredible work in classes and for external opportunities um, that sort of tag team with the CEC. And so sort of going back to this earlier question, if you have pre-existing connections, um, these are really easily tied together because we love to have that sort of web of connections to constantly grow upon. Um, and that's really primarily where the bulk of our work is. If you have things that are not already existing, create them, you're welcome to. There's also tons of opportunities already if you're just looking for something to get. Yeah, I wanted to jump in as well and say like Benjamin does so, so many things. Um, another thing that he does that I don't think that you mentioned, so I just wanna throw in there too, is that he's also been working and liaising with elected officials, um, working to kind of um, establish opportunities for Pitzer students to be able to work within local governance um, or with locally, affected, locally elected officials to shadow them, to support them, to learn from them, assist them with the things that they're doing. So um, we have a student right now who's working with a councilwoman um, working on an equity committee for the city of Adelanto, um, which is a city that's near nearish to campus. It's in the high desert area. It's also um, one of the areas where the uh, GeoCorp has an ICE facility, one of the largest in the area, um, and it, an immigrant detention facility. Um, and so the work of that equity committee is incredibly important. I talk with the student regularly, they're learning so much. Um, we're also looking to branch out and connect with um, some environmental analysis professors um, who can help with interpretation of air quality control board reporting and, and reports. Um, so there's a wide range of things to do within, that's just in that program, TPP, the, the People's Pitzer. Um, but as Benjamin mentioned, there's also um, work that's happening with native initiatives at Pitzer. Um, this serves our native and indigenous student population as well as faculty, staff, and community partners in the local area. Um, we've been uh, down a person for a little bit, but we're about to resume our search because of the pandemic, it was halted, um, but we're excited for that. So we'll be having a new um, assistant director of the native initiatives program happening soon. Um, and uh, we've also been working really closely with um, a fellow in the BSU um, student organization. So um, he's been working on helping us identify um, black founded, black led, black serving organizations with which students can partner. Um, and also he's putting on a current alumni panel right now to bring back um, like black alumni in order to uh, create more opportunities for current students to get to know them and to learn from them and develop networking relationships um, and also to share institutional history and memory. So these are just some of the things that, that are happening. Um, and certainly um, because they're happening with CEC, I just, I need to make sure that students and folks know um, that the students that we have working with us are phenomenal. They are the ones that are making so many things happen and our community partners as well. Some of them we've had for years. Um, we are always making new community partners. Um, and our goal is always to, uh, you know, do whatever we can in order to make sure that um, their relationship with us is one that's satisfying and meaningful to them. Um, and that, that means that they're being served through those partnerships. Looks like there is another question in the chat. Yeah, the Native Initiatives Program. Um, so Native Initiatives has been a program that was established, um, I wanna say back in, it was getting going maybe like in the late 2000s. Um, so it's been around for a long time. Uh, we have some big goals that, that we're working on for the program that we wanna see happening moving forward. Um, these are things that we're working on and I'm, 
pretty honest about these things, so I'm just going to share them with you. Um, we're, we need to hire uh, more Native faculty and scholars. We also need to make sure that we're admitting Native um, and Indigenous students. But before we start really trying to push for a big admissions push, we need to make sure that the students feel supported on campus and that they have a space of their own. So students right now are organizing to establish their own identity-based space on campus for Native and Indigenous students. Um, the students that are primarily doing that work, that organizing work, um, and pushing for that institutional change are our Indigenous Peer Mentor Program students or our Indigenous um, Students Alliance or students from the Indigenous Student Alliance. Um, so the Indigenous Peer Mentoring Program, also known as IPMP, um, that's also been around for years. Uh, there's another program that those um, students have been running. Um, I believe it's still going, but with the pandemic, it's been a little more challenging, um, but it's called Indigenations and they work with uh, local and um, actually national and international native and indigenous students um, to uh, make sure that they have tutoring opportunities or college access opportunities. Um, for many years, we had a native youth uh, to college program um, where we um, worked really intensely for two weeks um, to do a native um, college access program for um, high school students. Um, that's been on hi hiatus for a minute while we are waiting to fill this assistant director position, but um, we're hoping that that will continue again in the future. Um, we have had um, for years something called a, a native elders and residence program. Um, we had two phenomenal, phenomenal um, women from the San Gabrielino Tongva tribe, uh, Julia Bogani and Barbara Drake. Um, these ladies um, hosted students, they taught professors, they gave talks, they held healing circles, they did so many things. Um, and they have passed during this pandemic, um, which has been a major, major loss to Pitzer. Um, but we are still um, going to be continuing with the program and, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll be making some developments as we're able to get back in person again and be together. It's been a really difficult time for that program, um, but it's a, it's a really wonderful program and the students that are served by it are absolutely amazing and um, it's an honor to get to work with them. So um, a lot of like internal kind of organizing work that we're working on currently, um, but those things will of course expand in the future as the, uh, the positions filled, which we're hoping will be in a few months. Um, so yeah, it's like, um, let's see, if you volunteer with the CEC, do you have to continue consistently? That's a great question. Um, so if you're working through a social responsibility praxis course, um, you will have to do about 40 hours per semester. That's part of the structure of the classes. Um, and so the way that that happens can take place in different ways. It might be a series of weekends, um, it might be a few all day workshops or trainings or other things that you're doing. It might be that you do three hours a week every week for 16 weeks or, you know, however much it is. So um, those are different ways that it can happen. But if you're a volunteer, um, you know, that that might that you, of course, don't have the hour requirement in a class based setting that you would have otherwise. But, um, you know, it's it's there's different ways of getting involved. Sometimes there's things that we need immediately and students, or I'm sorry, community partners need us to make phone calls and they need us to write letters and anybody and everybody who can do that in that moment is really helpful. That's something that we need immediately. You could maybe get involved and do that one thing one time. It took a couple of hours of your life and a part, like we would be grateful and partners are grateful because we need people to mobilize when it's time to mobilize. Um, that said, if you want to develop a meaningful relationship with a community partner, which I highly recommend, 
Um, there are opportunities to do that. And it's more likely that you'll develop a meaningful relationship if you have some kind of sustained relationship with them. So there are opportunities to get involved for like a one-time thing or multiple things. But I suggest if you're really, really interested in this work, if you're really interested or invested in the work of a particular community partner, um, get in touch with them, find out what you can do, get in touch with us. And we can try to figure out, you know, a way for you to get involved. Um, in a sustained way, because uh, that that's going to be, um, I think, a more meaningful experience for you and also for the partner. Um, but like I said, don't shy away from those one time things, because we really need people to show up for that stuff when it when it comes down. Um, yeah, are there any other questions? You can also always feel free to email our staff if you think about questions later and um, you want to talk with us or if you want to email Benjamin directly. Um, I believe he put information down in the chat for everybody. Um, feel free to reach out to us at any time. The last thing that I will uh, throw in is that the CEC is also constantly hosting events and trainings. So if you're ever interested, they're usually on our Instagram or our sort of suite of associated Instagrams that'll be tagged. Um, so check us out there and you'll be able to see different ways to connect to. Perfect. Thank you both so much for sharing about the Community Engagement Center, our community partners, the People's Pitzer, and other opportunities to get involved. Um, for our students, you can make sure to follow them at Pitzer CEC on Instagram. Is that correct? Um, for any other information, um, and they're going to put that all into the chat as well. So thank you all again so much for coming. And we're going to take a quick break for about 20 minutes before we come back again to hear from our students about the justice education um, courses that we have called Inside Out. And then we also have a student representative from the Racial Justice Initiative. So thank you again so much for coming. And we'll be back in around 20 minutes. Hello, everybody. Nice to be with you today. Um, Chris, are you going to uh, join us? I, um, I can't start my video. OK, well, I'll, I'll start and then maybe hopefully you'll be able to start your video later on. Um, later on. Okay. Oh, there you go. OK. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to introduce myself first. Um, and then Chris and then Eamon, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, the art galleries, and then I'm going to show a few images and then pass it along to Chris. And then Eamon um, will be asking us some questions. So first of all, my name is Kira Ennis. I am the director and curator of Pitzer College Art Galleries. I also teach in the art field group and the courses that I teach are art history, curatorial and museum studies and senior thesis classes. So our mission at the galleries um, is to curate exceptional quality exhibitions that reflect the most important and critical issues um, of the day for both the campus, but also for the larger art world. And our exhibitions and programming reflect sociopolitical concerns. And in that way, we align with the college's core values, the core values of social responsibility, intercultural relations and understandings, racial justice and environmental justice. So our exhibitions tend to link to those grand themes. Um, and our goal really, um, being situated you know, on campus is to connect to the academic program and to provide this alternative object-based lens through which to examine different uh, fields of study. Um, so instead of uh, being focused on purely formal concerns, we really like to reflect you know, real world concerns. 
So before I show some images, I'm just going to uh, ask Chris to introduce himself and ask Eamon to introduce himself, and then I'm going to show some images. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Michnow. I'm the Exhibitions and Communications Manager for the Pittsburgh College Art Galleries. Um, and I've been here for um, nearly two years in this role. Um, I came to the galleries uh, with a background in writing and editing. Uh, I started writing uh, as an arts writer in 2007 and have been drawn during that time uh, to uh, writing about work uh, and curators and artists uh, who really address social and political concerns in their work. Um, that's been the most compelling concern of mine in, in my writing practice. Um, and for the, the four years prior to being at Pitzer, I worked as uh, the associate editor of a Los Angeles-based contemporary art magazine titled Artillery, uh, where I was in charge of reviews uh, and features, uh, as well as uh, recruiting writers. Um, um, I work in the galleries on uh, helping to manage all aspects of installing exhibitions um, and back end of, of shows, logistical support, as well as communications and marketing aspects of our work here in the galleries. Um, and I'll pass it on to Amen. Hello, I'm Eamon. I am a rising senior at Pitzer. I'm a media studies major and an anthropology minor. I work at the Office of Admissions as a tour guide, but I also work at the art galleries as a gallery fellow and a research assistant. So I'm just doing some virtual programming and working on some projects for Kira and Chris when they need it. I'm also going to be moderating and answering any audience questions and also asking Kira and Chris some pre-prepared questions later on. Thank you. Thank you both uh, very much. Um, and you're being very modest about your role as a fellow. Um, you're a very, very important part of the galleries and we're very grateful to the work that you do. Thanks, All right, Kira. so I am going to share my screen now and just show a few images about uh, from exhibitions that we've done. So, right, here we go. Can everybody see that okay? So I wanted to um, I wanted to start with this quote. Um, for those of you who read the New York Times and read the, the art reviews in the New York Times, Helen Cotter, has, I think, is one of the best critics. Um, and he is a big fan of um, you know university art museums and spaces. Uh, and as he says, you know, they're part classrooms, their laboratories, their entertainment centers, and so on. Um, but what, what's amazing about uh, university art museums is that they are unique spaces, and they are one of the last remaining sites where one can be truly experimental, because we as, you know, we are not behold, beholden to, you know, the number, to audience numbers or to getting the right amount of audience numbers in the space. So we can take a and do, um, you know, research-based exhibitions and try to be, you know, as um, experimental as possible. The other thing, of course, about university art museums is that they um, can use, you know, the rich uh, intellectual capital, you know, of the campus, both in terms of the faculty, but also the students and, of course, the staff. And this allows us to uh, program extraordinary events, um, panels, symposiums, which are always, um, from our perspective, um, interdisciplinary. So we actually very much uh, like to work with disciplines outside of art and art history. Of course, we always work with art and art history, but we, we love to work with um, you know, history, sociology, anthropology, environmental studies and so on, because you can have these really you know, rich and in-depth interdisciplinary conversations, um, which is very difficult to do uh, in freestanding you know, museums because uh, they don't have 
you know, all of these faculty members and staff and um, students at their fingertips. So this is what we aspire to do and hopefully do manage to do in some cases. Um, just going to move on to the next slide. I was just going to talk about colleges. Um, this, for example, is a show that's coming up in um, the fall. So all of you new students will see this. Um, it won't look exactly like this, but um, it, it, it's work made by uh, Sadie Barnett, uh, who has made work about her father, who had founded the uh, Compton chapter of the Black Panther Party in California. And it was a, as a result of all of his community organizing, uh, was uh, surveilled by the FBI. And they uh, put together essentially a 500 page dossier on him, um, and as a result of this, uh, they interviewed his friends, his childhood friends, and so on. And as a result of this, he, um, you know, he lost his job. Uh, he was alienated from his community, uh, from his neighbors, and so on. Um, and so Sadie, uh, they, they, the family filed a Freedom of Information Act, and uh, she uses the. Um, you know, the FBI documents uh, as a starting point and, and as a way to, you know, reclaim his history and his legacy. Um, and she adds, as you can see here, spray paint and um, these plastic jewels and gems and so on. He also uh, founded the first um, black gay uh, bar in San Francisco. Um, which the artist has recreated. And this is uh, the recreation of that bar at the ICA in uh, Los Angeles, which is an amazing art space in downtown LA. And as you can see, it functions as a real bar. Um, and the work that she's going to be showing at Pizza is um, uses that bar really as a starting point. She's creating uh, a living room installation and this living room is about creating you know a space for uh imagining you know possible and very different kinds of futures and within this installation there will be many photographs including that that's her aunt but also more personal um photographs like this which um relates to her father's copy of this particular book of speeches by Malcolm x um which were compiled, uh, well, actually it was published the year of his death in 1965. And they were the speeches that he made in the year running up to that, running up to his, his assassination. And this is Sadie holding, the artist holding her, you know, her father's copy. So it's very poignant. Uh, this was an exhibition that we had, um, sorry, I don't think, yeah, an exhibition that we had, um, last year and this is with the artist Candace Lynn I'm sorry if some of the images cut off maybe cut off at this side um, but this is a you know a 500 pound sarcophagus and this is a you know made out of uh, you know red clay and the sarcophagus is for the artist and for her cats when she dies so this piece is really talking about interspecies um, communication and collaboration um, and inside the sarcophagus is earth, and there are worms floating around or living in in the earth. Which um, you know, Chris had to uh, take care of this, and he watered the earth every day. So there's a you know there's a, a very important aspect to this work, which um, is the caring for these other species that are you know part of the exhibition. And there is a close up of that, as you can see. Um, and it references, I should say, it references the uh, sarcophagus, sarcophagi from the, the 6th century BCE. It's a really extraordinary piece. Um, so that was our last uh, big show last year. And upstairs we have these two uh, vitrines and inside the vitrines are these sort of bizarre skeletal forms, um, which are 
modified in some way that you would never see a, a, an animal carcass or human carcass like this. There are sort of added appendages um, and they've been covered with um, um, and mixed in with the meat paste are the artist's uh, skin and fingernails. Um, and then there are uh, beetles, dermistead beetles, um, which are a particular type of beetles that museums use for cleaning the flesh off bones before they exhibit them. And these beetles are running around um, eating the uh, the meat paste, which is combined with uh, the artist's um, skin, hair, and fingernails. Um, and then an exhibition we had uh, in 2018. This is by uh, another LA artist called Alana Madge, really fascinating, brilliant artist. And she was looking at the history of listening and speaking devices from the 17th century up to the present day. Um, so looking at them, uh, the very first ones in the 17th century, uh, which a particular, um, a particular curator, I should say, a curator of a museum in the 17th century built. And he um, used to hide these listening devices and in, inside um, sculptures so that he could uh, hear who was coming into his museum. Um, so the artist made uh, all of these diagrams that you see relate to um, this person called Anath uh, Athanasius Kierke, uh, who this, who's the 17th century polymath. Um, and these are his diagrams um, on diagrams on how to, uh, on different kinds of devices that he was making. And then you'll see that she also made these um, instruments. Um, so there's little kazoos, and uh, these sort of maraca type, um, maraca type instruments, um, which were then used as part of a um, performance. But before we go on to the performance, I just wanna talk about that very long instrument there that was borrowed from a Claremont Craft Museum, specifically you know, for the exhibition. So it was a way of bringing the, um, the village of Claremont into the exhibition itself and broadening audiences and so on. This is from the other, from a, um, the top of the museum looking down. There are also a number of performances and uh, you see the manuscript at the back wall. Um, and then there are the maracas and those maracas are made from cast of her friend's fingers. Um, and then this is the performance called the Grand Buddha Marching Band. Uh, and this was my class um, at the time. And we all went out and used her instruments to uh, take part in this performance outside and um, also incorporating you know, people in the street. Um, and then as, also as part of the exhibition, we um, collaborated with 323 Projects, which is a nomadic site uh, based or conceived uh, by an um, artist slash curator in LA. And it essentially exists, it exists as a, a telephone message so service. So um, as a viewer or going to the exhibition, you could pick up that phone, ring that number and answer the question, what if women were in charge? Um, and then uh, we recorded all of these messages and played them on the clock tower at Pizza at uh, intervals during the day. And then uh, this is by an artist called Jenny Oshansky. Um, and she did this incredible project of using the Californian invasive species list of plants as a starting point and then um, finding all the so-called invasive species on Pitts' campus, and then um, making these really beautiful uh, profiles um, of these individual plants. And it's really a way of talking about uh, exclusions and inclusions and who makes these lists, who's, in, who's allowed in and who's um, banned. And they, they're very delicate, beautiful drawings and collages. And I just included this because we're going to be showing this artist, I'm sorry, her name's cut off, it's Beatrice Cortez. 
and uh, she's not going to be showing this work, but this will give you an idea of what she does. Um, this is a imagined spaceship, uh, which is full of indigenous plant material and seeds, so that when it goes off into space, that when whoever, whatever species interacts with this spaceship, they will have um, you know, these indigenous uh, seeds that they can use and grow uh, to create food. So it's about um, a continuation of indigenous knowledges. And then very quickly, this is a very big exhibition. We also collaborate with other spaces. Uh, this is a contemporary art space in LA. It's the oldest alternative art space in LA called Los, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. And um, we did a project that was funded by the Getty Foundation. And it looked at a very important artist from the 70s uh, whose work had been sort of left out of the canon to some degree. Um, and we explored uh, his uh, amazing uh, electronic sculptures, uh, which were also uh, cybernetic to some degree. Um, and uh, also here we had, you know, these very forward thinking environmental installations, which he made in 1971. And so we had real bees in the gallery um, for a while. Um, and we had a special um, exit shoot for the bees so that they could go outside at you know, whenever they wanted and, you know, forage for food and um, get some daylight. Uh, and then they also had this symbolic garden. Obviously, they went flying around in the gal gallery for obvious reasons, but there was this, um, in the original installation in 1971, they were. <laughs> and so they would, uh, all of these plants apparently are favorites of the bees. So um, anyway. So there was a video camera hooked up to uh, the hive and then um, signaled to this monitor embedded in the garden so um, that you could you know, look at the monitor, see all the bees in detail, and also hear the sound. It's really an amazing show. And then I just uh, included this last slide. Obviously, this is not fit to college art galleries, but I love this image. This is what I want our museum to be. Um, this is actually, uh, and I don't mean literally, but uh, this is an image from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And what they have uh, instigated or had before COVID was um, exercise classes in the morning. So there are these alternative exercise classes that people could attend and they would walk and run and dance through the museum uh, before it opened. So we want um, our Pizza College art galleries to be as inviting and as open as, and as friendly as it can possibly be. We want you to feel at home there. So thanks, Eamon, you can take it away now. I'll stop, I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much for that presentation, Gear. It, it's so nice to like see the past of the Pizza Art Galleries and all the different cool artists you featured. I um, I loved the Candace Lynn exhibition when it was up, uh, despite the smell. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I, I personally think that the Pitzer Art Galleries are very welcoming. Um, so I just wanna open it up to anyone in the audience to ask any questions. Um, and we also have some pre-prepared questions that we wanna ask Kira and Chris just about the galleries and how they relate to the Pitzer community as a whole. So I am gonna start with, Here's a good one. Um, so how can students be involved in the galleries on campus? Okay, well, I think you can answer that to some degree actually, Eamon, and maybe you will answer it, but um, we have uh, a number of positions uh, for student interns. Um, one is a social media intern, and I'd like to ask Chris to answer that question. And I mean, that to talk about that role, and the other intern was really sort of curatorial and research-based, and you actually, Eamon, are doing both. <laughs> You're doing but you know, sort of combined position. But Chris, do you wanna talk a little bit about the social media position? Sure. Um, so the social media position is one where we have a student who's dedicated to um, building engagement with our exhibitions and our programming across various social media platforms. Um, and the idea is to um, regularly 
put out content that draws people into the galleries through the images, uh, images of the installation or the works in the galleries. Um, and in some ways to, to build um, not just eyes on, on the exhibition, but also the, the gallery as a site for conversation around um, co-curricular, um, just thinking, engaging conversation about the issues that are being presented in the shows um, and a way to increase um, just conversations across the campus. Um, as well as uh, across to other institutions. Yeah, and um, you know, as an art gallery fellow, I can say that it's very nice to work with Kira and Chris. Um, if you're interested in doing that when you come to campus, I would definitely recommend working for the galleries, 100%. Um, they're great people. <laughs> um, they're right here, obviously, so they can hear me. Um, <laughs> We have a couple of audience questions. So first up, what role does the gallery play in the community in regards to Pitzer's value of social responsibility? That's a really great question. Um, and uh, I can say that we have done quite a bit uh, with regards to, and we always do with regards to social, uh, social responsibility, but very specifically, Justin, um, we have done a number of exhibitions, for example, a show called Manifesto a couple of years ago, uh, which we call it actually an alternative manifesto, um, which was looking at new ways of conceiving um, what a manifesto is. And we worked with uh, not just, it ended up being a gigantic exhibition of uh, including 90 artists. And while many of those artists were, um, members of the uh, contemporary art world community, others uh, were connected to uh, prison populations. So for example, we went to um, Chino prison um, and uh, Norco prison. So the Chino prison, um, I think it's the men's prison and Norco prison is the women's prison. And we uh, did a series of workshops with artists and were able to uh, bring some of the work back from those workshops and include it um, in the exhibition. And the exhibition was structured in that um, artists could respond to uh, very particular issues. So for example, they were responding to uh, incarceration, immigration, resistance, um, spiritualism, and so on. Um, and uh, we also worked with another community uh, who were based in Claremont, but are now based slightly outside in an uh, area called Upland, about 10, 15 minutes away by car. And they were artists with, um, you know, developmental uh, disabilities. And we also did uh, workshops with them. And they, uh, their work was also included in the gallery. And another, actually, a, another important theme of that show was ableism. And we've um, continued uh, to work with uh, prison populations. Uh, we had a guest curated show called Disruption um, a year and a half ago. Uh, and it was the, the guest curator was somebody who'd started up um, this organization um, that she's an artist and a teacher, but her organization is going into prisons and using art as essentially as a tool um, for uh, helping people, you know, think through um, their current situations and respond to the world. And so this exhibition was curated, um, or rather uh, comprised with professional well-known artists, but also uh, those that were incarcerated, artwork, you know, currently incarcerated, but also those who uh, were previously incarcerated. So there's some of the exhibitions that we've done um, and, uh, you know, that highlight, you know, very specifically the work with communities, you know, outside of Pizza. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. Do exhibits at the gallery highlight the work of students who are art majors and minors? Every year we have what's called the senior thesis exhibition. Uh, so that usually takes place in uh, end of April through to mid-May. And uh, that highlights the work of the um, art majors, um, 
which is great because it uh, is a professionally curated exhibition, which the students obviously partake in the curating of it too. Um, and it's up, the exhibition is up through graduation. And so it's a really a wonderful opportunity for students to be able to highlight their work during uh, graduation. And so that um, audiences, not just at Pizza, but also from outside of Pizza are able uh, to come and see the work. And then this second question is, I'm pretty much related, um, but it says, can anyone just submit pieces into the gallery? Unfortunately not. Uh, we have a you know, number of different galleries on campus. So we have these two professional galleries, which are the Nichols and the Lensner. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, and they're what we call our professional galleries. And there we have a, you know, a program. We program our shows you know, two years in advance. Um, but there are a number of other spaces on campus, like Grove House, for example, um, and the Salafé Gallery, which is used by the um, Art Field Group as a, you know, a teaching gallery. Um, but the Grove House Gallery is available for students, and I think there's, a, um, there's something called the Art Collective, which is uh, connected to, the, to that gallery, so that, that space, so that, you, know, you're, you can apply to use that space. So there, there are plenty of smaller spaces um, on campus that students can show their work at. Um, wouldn't you agree, Eamon? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, you know, you said it with the Grove House and then the Shakedown Cafe also has a lot of student work. Um, right. Yeah, and then occasionally I've seen, you know, different classes that will have some sort of final class project that involves like converting the classroom into a gallery for a short period of time. Um, and that typically happens every semester as well. Yeah, especially actually in the, the photography down in the basement on McConnell, not McConnell, uh, Scott. Yeah, yeah. So there are many spaces on campus to uh, to show work. Yeah. Uh, and this one is a bit of a personal preference question. What have been all of your favorite shows featured there? Why don't you have a go at this, Chris, and I'll go second. Uh, so recent, in recent years, the, the Candace Lynn has been my favorite. Um, it's, it was really kind of a remarkable, remarkable sort of fusion of uh, concept and material. Um, the, the sarcophagus was extraordinary and the process of building it um, was uh, months long. Um, Candace worked in the, um, the Pitzer College uh, ceramics studio um, through a residency program that was established by our, um, our uh, ceramics professor Tim Berg, um, and it's the second time we've had a, a collaboration with the ceramics residency. Um, the first time being the Alana Mann uh, exhibition, um, and then the Alana Mann show. Um, the opening uh, reception included a, a performance um, by a group, uh, a musical group. Um, uh, there were two performances, but one of the performances was by a musical group that had written uh, an opera um, about um, what was, it was based on, um, cor correct me if I'm wrong, Kira, this is, uh, I believe it was based on um, a text um, from, uh, that was a couple centuries old. Uh, is that it's Is Bluebeard's, I think it's Bluebeard's Castle. Right, exactly. It's based on, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it was uh, an extraordinary performance that uh, kind of commented on the uh, current social uh, political climate. Um, and uh, it really was a, a protest against, uh, and one of the readings could have been uh, a protest against uh, the phenomenon of, uh, of Donald Trump. Um, and uh, so it was a profoundly moving performance. Uh, so those are, those are two of my favorite shows in, in recent years. And I would have to say that um, for me, the Alana, the, again, the Alana Man was one of my favorite shows uh, because there was so many different components to that shows and it, to that exhibition and it was activated throughout 
you know, it was um, up for three months and there were either, you know, performances um, or panels or, um, you know, performances happening outside the space or, you know, the, um, the recordings at the clock tower. It was really, you know, a fabulous use, you know, because so often, um, you know, one of our complaints about exhibitions generally is that, you know, as soon as you put a show up, it, it you know, it, see, it just ceased to live anymore. So one of our goals is to, you know, keep it alive, you know, through, you know, these other, other events, but also the idea of the show, which really did, you know, have this incredible, you know, historical breadth looking at this, you know, one of the first museums in existence in the 17th century from Rome and the curator who, um, you know, had curated the, these amazing um, speaking and listening devices, but also everything else that he had in that, in his own museum uh, and the experiments that he did in museums and in his own museum. And it's what we want our museum to feel like, you know, this sort of active, you know, hub. Um, so that was definitely my favorite. Also the Jenny Oshansky I loved um, because, she, you know, she really did use the whole of the campus as a laboratory to find all of these um, so-called, you know, invasive species. And we were able to host her during the summer. So she did a sort of residency, an informal residency uh, during the summertime and collected, collected all these plants um, and worked with everyone at Pizza from the groundskeepers to um, for, you know, various uh, field group members and of course with us and um, the actual execution of the work, um, these beautiful profiles of plants, which then since then she has developed um, individual identities for those plants, which exist as uh, recordings, little podcasts based on each one of those of those plants. Um, and I think she inserted it in um, in a garden. Um, and so you could walk around the garden and you could listen to the individual stories um, of these plants. It's a very beautiful piece. And I'm also very excited about our upcoming show, the Sadie Barnett exhibition. Very excited about that. It's lovely to be able to do a collaboration. And this is our, will be our third collaboration with Pomona, Pomona Museum, which are now called Benton. They're obviously a much bigger uh, museum than ours. Um, but this is going to be an exciting adventure between the two of us and uh, it'll allow it's two very different aspects of the show, but, you know, it's only a walk away between, you know, Pomona and Pizza. And also, actually, just to mention um, that we're going to have an amazing event connected to that, which will, um, you know, her father, the, the, the artist will be in conversation with her father. And also, um, it'll be a three-way conversation, conversation, her father, Sadie, and also, um, one, uh, Erica Huggins, um, who led, was the leader of the Black Panther Party for 15 years. There's going to be a conversation between the three of them, and that's going to be um, early December. That's um, exciting. Yeah, it is very exciting. Yeah. We have another question from an attendee. Can students learn about art installation through the gallery? Yes, because if you intern with us, then you will no doubt be set to work um, and we'll be doing painting and construction work, working side by side uh, with, a, with Chris um, and also um, our preparator, um, which we which we we're in between preparators at the at the at the moment, but we should have, but we will be having we will have a preparator by the fall. So yes, absolutely. Um, if you choose to intern with us. And I think there are also a couple of um, curatorial classes offered occasionally that like go more in depth with the process of curating. The ones I teach are more uh, history and theory based actually, but um, I think there are a couple of others that, that are probably more practice based, but anybody who works with us, you know, essentially, obviously, when I'm in the gallery, I will be teaching it anyway, as Chris will be teaching it um, installation, because we'll be doing it. So. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and it looks like we have one more question. What has been happening with the galleries during uh, the virtual time? Yes, well, uh, first of all, we had an exhibition by uh, a Mexican artist called Minerva Cuevas. Um, we didn't realize at the time, I mean, nobody did. So we, we were just sort of playing it as it went along that the campus was gonna be closed for the entire year. So we installed a show in the fall, expecting the campus to be open and expecting visitors. Um, however, given that uh, it wasn't open, we programmed a series of um, lectures and workshops uh, with the artists. So the artists came to visit, you know, obviously virtually um, to first year, a number of first year seminars. Um, and depending on what the, um, what the subject of those classes were, so for example, one of them was on food justice. So she um, geared her lecture around food justice. And another one was based on contemporary um, film and video. And of course, that's a very different kind of lecture. Um, and another one was based on writing. And so she was kind enough to be able to, you know, do a number of programs with us. Um, in addition to that, and I'll let Chris talk about this, um, we have been programming a series of um, <clears throat> Zoom conversations with our alumni um, who are, you know, involved uh, in the art world. And maybe Chris would like to say a few words about that. Uh, sure. Um, so we uh, started in uh, last uh, April or, or March. Um, in developing a series of conversations, as Kira mentioned, um, with alumni um, who are either practicing artists or curators. Um, and that was also in, in collaboration with our um, alumni uh, and family relations office. Um, so we um, approached a number of uh, Pitzer alumni who are actively practicing artists um, and um, one curator um, to talk about their work um, and to or to talk about their research. Um, and we programmed, I think it was about um, for a while, it was about two a month, uh, and then it kind of we slowed down a little bit uh, to to one a month. But there were some really interesting conversations um, from people who graduated as far back as the late 1980s um, to the uh, to the mid 90s um, to even more recently um, in the uh, late 2000s. Um, so it's a really interesting. Um, series of conversations that spans generations of uh, students um, who've been at Pitzer who are now engaged in the art world. Um, and I would encourage you to uh, check out those recordings either on uh, the Pitzer Galleries website or the Alumni and Family Relations website. And then I'll um, just speak. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, um, you know, the gallery fellows are also doing virtual events. Um, yeah. So right now, um, if you've been on the tour of Pitzer's campus, you know about the Pitzer free wall. Um, obviously, a lot of students can't access the free wall. So the fellows have been running a virtual free wall online. Um, and we've been doing weekly updates of that. And then we also host a couple of fellows events. This week, we're actually hosting an event to de-stress before finals centered around um, music and building a community-centered playlist. So we're excited for that. And what's really great about the fellows um, or the fellow, you know, how the fellows program is that they fellow very, they, sorry, they program very specifically for their peers. So they, then, you know, Eamon, Jessica and Marcus are not programming for the staff. They're not programming for the faculty, but they're pro pro programming, creating programming for you. Um, and we do have plans, uh, and Eamon will be helping with this, of building a, you know, a student board uh, to do more programming for students, which hopefully we'll be able to work on uh, this fall. So the, the fellows, um, and we have, and we, our, our fellows will continue on next year, um, but then they're all graduating. Um, but a very important part of how we conceive um, of the galleries these days, um, because as the last image that I showed on the slideshow, 
we really want you to feel like this space is for you. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you all so much for uh, telling us about the art galleries and informing students what you guys do. Uh, thank you so much to all of our students who attended. We have another session going on starting at five about the racial justice initiative and inside out courses at Pitzer. I'm gonna put the link to attend that in the chat and then I'll send a few other links, but thank you all so much for coming and have a good rest of your day. And thank you again to our panelists and Eamon for moderating. Thank you for inviting us and thank you so much, Eamon, as always. No problem. See you soon. Bye. 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 Hello, everyone, and welcome back from our break. My name is Dawn O'Shea. I'm an admission counselor here at Pitzer College, and I'll be moderating our panel today on Racial Justice Initiative and our Inside Out program. Um, why don't we go around and have each of the students introduce themselves, tell me, tell us a little bit more about what you do at Pitzer um, and how you're involved with either the Racial Justice Initiative or the Inside Out program. Let's start off with Kaylee. Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Kaylee. My pronouns are she, her. I am from Dallas, Texas, originally. Um, and I am a senior at Pitzer studying political studies with an emphasis in food justice and food policy. Um, some of the things that I do on campus, I sing in the Pomona College Choir. I led the Green Monday Initiative to improve sustainability in the dining halls on campus. Um, and I also was a leader of a club on campus called Claremont Students for Animals for all animal lovers at the Claremont Colleges. Um, and then my involvement with um, this program is um, my favorite class so far, actually, that I've taken at the five C's in my, all my four years has been um, my class that I took in the Inside Out program. I took a course called the Political Economy of Food. Hi, everyone. My name is Quentin, but a lot of people call me Q. I am a second year at Pitzer. I use the he series pronouns and I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. At Pitzer, I am a prospective sociology and political studies combined major. And specifically what I plan to do with that is kind of like pursue a PhD in like a sociology of education program because I'm really interested in educational reform. And aside from being the student representative of the President's Racial Justice Initiative, um, I'm affiliated with the First Generation College Student Club, the Black Student Union at Pitzer, the Sociology Field Group Student Liaison, and yeah, I'm just excited to be here. Hi everyone, my name is Izzy, my pronouns are she, her. I am a senior at Pitzer College. I'm originally from Maine, kind of following this uh, major track. I am majoring in sociology and minoring in political studies, so very similar to Q. Um, when I'm not a tour guide at Pitzer, I'm a manager at the entirely student-run cafe on campus called The Shakedown. Um, also been a leader and a part of Pitzer Outdoor Adventure, Food Recovery Network, 5C Prison Abolition Group, um, and I have not taken an inside out class, but I think maybe the comparable experience is being a part of the CASA program and working um, for Starting Over, which is a organization that's based in the Inland Empire and uh, provides reentry and rehabilitation services to formerly incarcerated people. And hi everyone, I'm Jacob. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am a second year at Pitzer and I am originally from San Diego area. Um, I am double majoring in history and politics with a minor in biology. And then outside of the classroom, I'm involved with our student senate. I am a uh, student senator for the academic planning committee. I forgot which committee I was on for a second. Um, and uh, I'm also a uh, leader in our um, Middle Eastern Student Association. I'm the president. I'm also the identity board representative for our Rainbow People Collaborative, um, which is our queer and trans student support group. And then um, I've also been um, a part of the leadership for Students for Justice in Palestine and some other political organizations inside and outside of campus. Um, and then uh, in terms of this, uh, I'm currently a part of uh, an inside out class that's working with the uh, eight um, 
matriculated students, and I'm also in Senate working on some legislation to help um, give uh, those eight BA students and just other inside out students more of a voice in our students. Y'all are involved in so much, it's hard to keep track of all of them. Uh, but to start off, what is the Racial Justice Initiative? Mm -hmm. Can someone explain that better? I, I guess I can explain it. So um, the Racial Justice Initiative was put in place by uh, President Oliver in light of all of the active police brutality that we've seen against Black people um, in the United States. And so essentially, um, through the Racial Justice Initiative, we see transformation, um, institutional transformation in three different ways. And so we have curricular transformation where faculty can apply for like funding to kind of switch your courses and make it more like inclusive in terms of using like critical pedagogy or inclusive pedagogy to just take into the lived realities of black people, criminalization, policing, um, and things in that like kind of area. And then also we have co-curricular transformation where student groups specifically can apply for like funding of up to $5,000 and kind of like hold different collaborative events, whether it be student activism, or, you know, if you just want to do a collab between like the Black Student Union, the Asia Pacific um, American um, Club, and then we just do a collab with that, we can just apply for money through that. And so that would be an example of like co-curricular transformation. And then lastly, we have institutional transformation. And so through institutional transformation or structural transformation, more specifically, our faculty will be going under, you know, like new um, implicit bias trainings. And of course, for students, we hope to implement something uh, during orientation adventures for our, our new incoming class and for all other students kind of to be um, engaged with. So hopefully that sums up exactly what we do on the RJI. So we meet bi week and we just talk about different things is going to make kids are better. We hold many different events. Um, our most recent event was an event called um, Color in the Ivory Tower, where we just invited all faculty of color to speak about how can we make Pitzer more diverse in terms of faculty, um, just so it can reflect the student population as well. So yeah, we do a lot of good things on campus. And what about the Inside Out program? What does Inside Out program mean? Um, how have you engaged with it? Uh, what are the goals of the program? Yeah, so um, the Inside Out program, uh, so what we have is we have a partnership with um, Norco College and um, uh, CDCR, um, which allows us to do um, Inside Out pedagogy, which is um, a style of education that uh, has half the students be inside students um, or uh, incarcerated individuals, and then half the students be um, from the college or university that they're uh, teaching with. And so Inside Out is a program that's across the, the nation. Um, Pitzer is one of the schools that uh, practices Inside Out pedagogy. Um, and then another thing about our Inside Out program uh, that is really unique is that we're the first uh, Inside Out program uh, that uses Inside Out pedagogy to have um, eight students um, that we have our eight cohort students um, earn their uh, bachelor's degree in organizational studies. So we have eight students that are fully matriculated Pitzer students um, and some are graduating this year, some will be graduating next year. Um, and so that's just a really unique aspect about our Inside Out program. Um, how it works is that they're taught like all other classes. There's a professor, um, gives you reading, um, you write papers, uh, everything like that. Uh, why I really like Inside Out is I think because I have some of the best conversations that I've ever had um, in a classroom. It feels like an actual uh, discussion and I've never really had that in uh, other classes. Not to say other classes are bad, but uh, this is the first time that I've really uh, ever had like a discussion that I'm like, wow, this is like what college looks like in like movies, like this is it in action. Um, and so uh, that's a bit about the, the Inside Out program. I don't know if anyone else wants to. Yeah, I'll add. Um, that was a, a great summary of what it is. I think another one of the things that I've loved so much about my experience in the Inside Out program is that there's really an emphasis on valuing all different types of um, knowledge and of education. And I, for me, I feel 
heavy imposter syndrome in the classroom where I, I feel this pressure to say things a certain way and to pull out these, you know, theories and these scholars from hundreds of years ago that I'm, you know, not super versed in. I'm not super confident explaining that all the time. Um, and we, you know, with the Inside Out program, half the students are folks who haven't had access oftentimes to these traditional forms of academia and knowledge that we um, put on a pedestal a lot um, in our um, in our classroom on campus. Um, and so I feel like the discussions are just, they're freer, they're um, more enriching, you know, like Jake, Jacob said, um, because we can talk about our lived experiences also being, you know, meaningful um, in academic conversations. How do you guys think that the racial justice initiative or the inside out program has impacted the Pitzer community. I can answer the first part of the question. Um, specifically, I will say, so because we've been remote for the entire like academic year this year, um, a lot of student groups haven't been able to, you know, like do the collaborative events that I said that, um, we attempt to do through co-curricular change. However, we expect that to be more useful in all of the funding that we do have to be used um, next year, especially when we are like uh, plan to be in person. However, I will say through the curricular transformation, so many faculty and students have felt um, in light of like an online semester, they have felt that through the racial justice initiative, classes have been, you know, more inclusive to like the lived realities of people who have been like historically excluded from education and historically excluded from these type of um, classes that we do teach at Pitzer. And so um, there are so many new classes that we were able to fund and to just get them switched in terms of including more like authors that come from marginalized communities or authors that identify as first gen and stuff like that. So it kind of just opens up the pedagogy. So, you know, you're not just reading like old white authors, you're actually reading people that that have experienced this, like you're literally reading someone's own lived experience rather than you have someone try to conceptualize or theorize someone's lived experience, which just makes it so much more better and fosters like a better learning environment because you just feel like you can apply what this specific person went through because you may identify with that person to the classroom and it kind of like enriches the classroom and enriches the discussion, which just makes the Pitzer in, um, educational environment so much more better, so yeah. I also jump in and like adding to like what Q says is I think it really has come and like helped act as like a, a moment of like reflection and like um, rebuilding for like the Pitzer community to really see like what more can they do and like how are they they being inclusive how are they you know uh, pushing the norms uh, challenging like this like academia tower that we live in because I think that's one thing that Pitzer discusses a lot and tries to, to be reflexive of is what is this academia that we're, we're a part of and how can we make it more accessible? And I think, especially with like the Inside Out program, I think that's one one of the many ways um, that we're working to do that. And I think also with like the Racial Justice, Justice Initiative, a lot of like the programming that I've been to surrounding that has also been like talking about like, how do we make academia like more accessible? Um, which is something that I've really appreciated, especially like there's been some like political talks from like the Racial Justice Initiative and they always touch upon like how can we make politics not this like exclusive thing because I feel like at times it so much is. Um, but th they also tie that into academia and everything else and it, it's just, I think it really has allowed Pitzer to be reflexive and, and look at how, how they can be better and more inclusive in all of their practices. How do you think these programs have engaged with Pitzer's core values? Um, I can start off. Well, I, one of our requirements to graduate, I mean, we have pretty non-traditional requirements and one is social justice theory and social justice praxis. Um, and I think that a lot of the programs that we have like are really great for social justice practice and they practice and they involve um, community organizations or going to local schools, various things. But I think uh, to actually embody social justice practice at the institution, as opposed to like seeing what can be done externally, like both are obviously valid and incredibly important. But if we're not like then reflecting it, 
within the institution, then I think ultimately it can feel a little empty or like the promises that we're holding ourselves up to can feel a little empty, especially at a predominantly white institution like Pitzer. Um, that's just what I would say. Anyone have any, anything else to add? I think Izzy nailed it. Uh, Izzy, there is a question for you specifically in the Q&A about your experience working through the Community Engagement Center. Does that tie into Racial Justice Initiative or the Inside Out program in any way? Um, I mean, not like directly, like the, it, the organization that I interned for obviously is involved in rehabilitation and reentry services, but they're not like directly tied, but I can still expound a little bit if you so desire, or I don't have to. Please share. Okay. Um, so I think one of the, one of my favorite programs that I've been a part of at Pitzer is used to be referred to as Pitzer in Ontario, but has since been rebranded to CASA, um, Crit Critical Action Social Advocacy. And that is a program that includes three credits. So you're doing a 125 hour internship, and then uh, you're also participating in like two classes, critical community studies and research research methods for community change. Um, and that whole program I think is also really reflexive of this idea of praxis just because generally like one of the classes research methods for community change um, really focuses on actually doing research that isn't just adding to the sociological or like academic um, discipline and instead is actually like helpful. <laughs> it's like what communities actually want um, taking into the considerations like and whether that they need certain statistics to apply for grants or whether that is um, a desire to have like certain research compiled, like you're learning how to do research, research that's like tangibly meaningful and can actually provide people with like more financial resources as opposed to this more like ethereal, I'm adding to the discipline um, idea, which I think is like <laughs> really important. And then specifically the organization. So you can kind of interact with um, any of the community partners. So starting over is just one of them. There are other ones, including Huerta de Valle, which is a community garden. And then there's also um, Workers Warehouse Resource Center, just because the Inland Empire, where the Claremont colleges are located, uh, Amazon's really big. There's tons of warehouses. And obviously, workers' rights are an incredibly important um, thing to focus on, specifically in this location. So you, whatever <laughs> your um, interest is, you can of like apply to kind of be a community partner with them. And then um, within that organization, you could have a different role. You could have an organizing role. You could have a, um, I had a like public policy role. So for me, that meant like lobbying um, to sheriffs and local legislators, like try to not continue building jails or to like, if this plan is going to go through at the very minimum, like people deserve a a room in which like um, people from the outside can interact with people from the, in the inside in like a safe and a safe way to like try to maintain some familial relationships. So that's what that looks like. Um, but each organization is entirely different and the position that you will have in that organization is just really dependent on like what that community partner needs as opposed to like what you think obviously is important, which is just the general ethos of community organization and um, community engagement at Pitzer. Yeah, I think that's great. I think all, all three, CASA, um, Inside Out, and Racial Justice Initiative does tie well into uh, each other at Pitzer. Um, we do have, we did have a session uh, an hour ago on the CEC, so if any students are interested in learning more about that, you can definitely watch the recording for it. Um, we have a question from the audience about what is the process of signing up for an Inside Out class, uh, and I want to add on to that if one of you could or multiple of you could share an experience of what going to an inside out class looks like. Yeah. Um, so um, signing up for an inside out class is, it's pretty much in my experience, it's been pretty much the same as signing up for any other class. Um, so it's on the portal, um, just like all of your classes, all of your other classes would be when you go for registration, there'll just be a little course code next to it that says IO to indicate that it will be an inside out course. Um, additionally, the inside out courses, um, professors will tend to have a, um, a application, I guess is maybe the word I should use, but I think that's the word they use, but it's not 
it's it's not as scary as it sounds, um, where it's just pretty much asking you, you know, what experience have you had with incarcerated folks? Have you ever been inside of a carceral facility? Um, why do you want to go on this? Um, why do you want to be a part of this program? Things like that. Um, and just to make sure that you're being really mindful of the fact that this is a different experience than um, than just taking a class at Pitzer. Um, and then, so that's the signing up for the class. Um, and then as far as the actual experience of going into the correctional facility, um, it was really a shock for me, I have to say. I have family members who have been incarcerated, but I have never like gone to a carceral facility before. Um, and I was really surprised to just to be to be quite frank like I was very scared when I went in um, and not because of the incarcerated folks around me but because there were lots of armed guards um, everywhere <laughs> and that was really intimidating um, and you know I I think for me this is going to sound super cliche but it was kind of a shock to think about like, oh, there are people who live like this 24 seven with just folks watching them with these giant guns. And that is like, I knew that, but I didn't like, you don't feel that until you're there. Um, and it was a really interesting environment to be trying to learn in, um, cause you're in a classroom, um, with, um, like you have guards that but come in and out of the classroom periodically to like check in on you and make sure everything's okay. And I'm like, we're, we're just having class. <laughs> we're just here. We're just learning. We're, we're discussing marks right now, actually. <laughs> Not much happening. Um, so it was a really, it was, it was an, an um, kind of a, an unnerving experience at times at the, at the beginning. Um, but also really cool once you just like, relax and you're you know just getting to to talk to people who just had different experiences and less privileges than I myself had um and ended up in this situation um but yeah if anybody else wants to, to talk on that experience no yeah I, I think you kind of covered it all I, that I'll add also about like the inside out like signing up for them is like the main thing that like they they try to like make sure of is that like you're not going in there to like study like do anything like that because like that's not what the point of the classes are you know um it's it's not to like make sure that like you're observing or you're doing research like no like that's not why you go on an inside out class or take an inside out class it's because you're passionate about the subject and you want to learn about it um that's like also like my policy is like I don't look for like an inside out class to take an inside out class like I look for like a class that I'm interested in and if it happens to be inside out like that's just great you know but like I'm not like looking specifically for one of course if you're a senior and you haven't taken one I suggest doing that but um especially like in your earlier years like just you know like don't don't try to force it um or like take class just to be like I've taken a class um and there's definitely always going to be like an opportunity that will come around that you'll be like oh, this class is really interested and it just happens to be inside out. That's one thing that I really like is like our inside out program also like has like a large breadth of like subjects that they teach in, you know, like I think even like over the, they're doing some summer courses and like I think there might even be like a dance course that might be like an inside out class. Like they're doing like political inside out classes, um, some writing courses that are inside out. Um, I know like Soch, um, they're working on also doing like more like Keck uh, science classes inside out. So in terms of like subject matter like it's a, it's a really large breath which is something that I also appreciate for our inside out classes and obviously with our inside out classes those are not classes that you can take every day um, or a couple times a week so how far is the California Rehab Rehabilitation Center and um, and what's the process of getting there and, and starting your class Yeah, um, Jacob, you can correct me on this or Q if you've been, I forget if you've taken an inside out course, but I think the drive is like an hour ish. Um, and we would ride in a bus. Um, we'd all gather on on campus and then ride in a bus um, to the um, rehabilitation center and then um, you, you know, go through a pretty long pra um, process of getting checked in. The check-in process itself takes about 30, 45 minutes. Um, and then you have your class. Your class lasts 
um, about two and a half to three hours, um, and it meets once a week. So you do that every, for me, it was every Thursday. So every Thursday I did that. Are you, any of you currently in an inside out uh, class or were, were in one last semester? Could you touch upon what that looks like in a virtual format? Yeah. Um, so personally, this is like a hot take, but there's definitely some like perks of like online learning. Um, and one of them is with this inside out class, we're able to have a lot of speakers come. Um, so like typically when we're in person, like it's really hard to get a speaker to come in because they have to also go through the clearance and everything else. Um, but virtually right now, we're able to have like a lot of speakers come in. So it's been really great. I've personally loved it. And I, I know a lot of like the inside students have also uh, have really appreciated it because they've been able to to have students uh, or have speakers come in and talk to us about um, what prisons are like, especially because my class is like a carceral state in a comparative perspective. And so like we're looking at like prisons in like Uganda, prisons in Scotland, like prisons like globally. And so we're actually able to have like speakers from these uh, international facilities come and like speak to us remotely, um, which is something that like I've also really appreciated is that like we're, we're able to like actually have like a more like not just reading, but like hear from people talking about like what the facility is like on the ground or like just watching a movie or something like that. It's it's a bit more interactive. Um, but in terms of like the rest of like our, our class virtually, um, uh, it it's I'd say the hardest part is probably our group project just because we do have to like, we're doing like a group project. So like it's hard to like coordinate because um, they don't always have access to their uh, computer to like send like us a, a message through the like messenger that we use. Um, and they don't like always have like access to Gmail or anything like that. They don't actually have a Gmail. It's just through like our our school education program, Sakai. Um, we just message through there on a forum. And so it's really hard to to get in contact with them sometimes, but it, it's really great because uh, we're able to like during class have like short little snippets and uh, everyone knows how to use those really effectively. Um, but besides that, it's it's been, I personally have enjoyed the class a lot virtually. Um, and I found it's been really, really effective um, in still being able to like learn and have this like inside outside experience with the um, folks that are incarcerated and with the students that are um, on the outside. And then like another fun fact is that like some of the um, uh, incarcerated students actually have now been able to like um, move beyond like the incarceration facility. And so they're now actually um, out and have been able to actually like do um, like a drive by of Pitzer. And so it was really cool. They took like a picture of them like standing by the sign and then because uh, they live in LA area. So they on their way home, they like stopped at Pitzer, took a picture in front of the sign and sent it to everyone in the class. So that was just like exciting to see. So we've been talking a lot about what the racial justice initiative is and, and the Inside Out program. And I think our audience has a pretty good understanding of it by now. Um, kind of looking into the future, what are ways that we can improve the racial justice initiative um, or the Inside Out program at Pitzer? Um, I will say how we can improve the racial justice initiative will probably be um, definitely more funding. I feel like in order to have something sustainable at Pitzer, we definitely need the money for it. And if we want to, you know, really make racial justice to be like, to make it more than an initiative, then we need more money to make it more sustainable at Pitzer and make it like an actual goal that we seek out. We don't wanna just be like, oh, just because like the police just did this to another black person, we're gonna throw money and we're gonna make new classes for next academic year. Then we're gonna go back to like how we used to teach. So I think um, definitely through funding and through like um, fundraising and all of that stuff, which is something that we heavily plan to do in the next years, um, in the next couple of years, um, it will kind of like make it more sustainable. And so we definitely would need more student engagement. Like as of right now, I'm the only student on the um, racial justice initiative, like the only like student on a committee. And so we have like two faculty members, but hopefully, hopefully in the fall, like we will be able to expand it and add more students just because like, I can't speak for the entire student body because uh, cause I just don't, I don't identify with every single identity. So um i just think having students that come from different backgrounds come from different identities having different lived experiences that can be like oh this is wrong because of this like having someone there 
that can tell you we shouldn't do it this way, we should do it this way. And so um, I say all that just to say, I definitely think money will make things more sustainable, especially with the racial justice initiative, because a lot of things that we do, like we fund research, we fund classes and everything, but in order for us to continue to do that, we will need the resources and the money to do so. And we will need like students that actively want to engage um, in making it sustainable. So, yeah. What about the inside out program? Are there ways that we could improve that? I have I have a lot of thoughts about how they could improve it. Um, so I'll try to I'll try to keep it concise. I agree with Q. I think more funding is always needed for every single program, especially when it's programs like this, um, like the Inside Out program or the Racial Justice Initiatives. I think those those definitely could use uh, way more funding. But uh, uh, for the Inside Out program, I think another thing is just also like really push more faculty and like professors to to do it. like of a breadth of courses, you know, and like, also like teach some of those classes that like, um, not all, like, I think a lot of the courses um, also tend to be focused around like incarceration and like what that means maybe from like a sociological perspective or like from like a, a political perspective, but realize like that's not the only thing that like the inside students wanna learn about. Like there's, there's one student who's really passionate about like engineering and like learning about like STEM and physics. And so like, I think like encouraging like physics professors to go and like teach a physics class inside and maybe like, it might be like a higher up physics and um, stuff like that, or like push like EA staff to like teach more like environmental justice classes in there and try to look at like intersectionality also of like how like the the prison industrial complex like affects more than just like sociology and politics. Because I think that's where a lot of the, the focus is, but I think uh, push more STEM, STEM faculty and uh, science professors to, to teach inside out classes um because because i think there's a really a really strong connection that students want that um and we shouldn't kind of limit them because that is probably one of the other things is like there's only so many classes that they can take and i and i i struggle with that because i'm like there's so many courses though across the claremont colleges like i'm struggling right now like we're, we're registering and i'm like there's over 500 classes i'm like i'm struggling to find one, ones that i like you know where like for them it's like here's like a handful you know or two handfuls actually there's usually about like 10 to 20 classes when we're in person at least um and so it's like how how do we broaden that so that like they have more more choice even uh, beyond like what's typically taught Q, with your involvement with racial justice uh, sorry racial justice initiative and everyone else's involvement in inside out program Obviously, not all Pitzer students are engaged with that. So, how do you think your involvement in your program has impacted your other classes, your college education, um, or your friend groups at Pitzer? Q, you don't have to start. Someone else could start. <laughs> um, I can jump in real quick. Uh, I. I'd say it's changed me because I now talk about it all the time, I feel. Um, it's just like something that like, I'm also like thinking about like, oh, like how can I like incorporate like this to like my inside out pedagogy or like, how could I like be more of an advocate also for like those that are like incarcerated? I think that's something that like definitely has transferred out of like this, this class is like, how can I be more of an advocate and like be more engaged and like, be more supportive of those that are incarcerated. And so like, um, definitely like one thing is like working with like Kayla and other student senators to like pass this legislation in Senate to allow there to be a specific like special representative that can like be a voice for like inside out students and like formerly incarcerated students. I think that's one thing that that's I've really been pushed through with this class is like, how can I, I personally do more outside of this class, you know, like I learned so much and like I do so much within this program, but like, this program also like I'm only going to be here for another two years at Pitzer, you know, like what, what am I going to do to like continue this work that I'm doing now and like keep pushing for like the abolition of like the prison industrial complex or like reform or like whatever folks are pushing for. I think that's, that's one thing that like I'm thinking about is like, how can I keep going beyond this? Um, because I think that's something that's really, like really prevalent, like sitting in this class and having discussions. 
is what what's beyond this like four months that I'm in. Um, I can speak a, a little bit maybe to the friend group thing. I think that there is um, like a diversity of people at, at Pitzer and although there is definitely like a, a more predominant orientation towards politics, um, there are definitely like, there's shades and degrees on that scale. So there's gonna be people who are um, definitely like identify very clearly as abolitionists and leftists or anarchists. Um, and I think that when you become involved in groups that have those similar ideologies, so if that's like being involved with prison abolition group, or if that's being involved in, you know, whatever, or like um, SJP or whatever group that is, then obviously that's pretty naturally uh, affects who you become friends with. Like, yes, people of different ideological backgrounds become friends, but also if you see that as central to your identity, like having a belief system that's based in one of those things, then obviously your friends are maybe gonna be oriented towards that ideology as well. Um, and it's just, I think, at least for me coming from like a rural conservative, predominantly conservative town, like kind of feeling like a crazy person for most of my life. Um, and then like feeling like, oh, there are people who are like so expansive in their reimaginations of the world. And then like being able to be a part of that and like seeing people I don't know, like as corny and cheesy and cliche as it is like dream and reimagine, I think has been really great. And yeah, I think lastly, what I can add in terms of like the, the courses that the Racial Justice Initiative have funded and the classes that I've personally been um, affiliated with, um, I would say it has definitely made me way more critical about certain things to the point that like sometimes I get irritated with myself. Like I could be watching TV and you not know, just like, apply a theory to something I'm like oh so that's why that person acts like that and it's not like I used to not be like that but since I'm learning so much and like understand like all of it it's just like oh now I can conceptualize this and now I understand like this so um sometimes I just want to sit and watch tv and just not think about it but just in the back of my head I'm like oh yeah but um I would say it's just definitely made me um, just more interactive and just more like passionate about certain things and just more passionate about like getting to know other students specifically at Pitzer um, because I feel like I thrive off of like hearing what other people are passionate about hearing what other people are interested in researching just because it just makes me look like oh, okay this person wants to do this it makes me be like okay I want to do this too and we just all work together like as a community. That was great. Um, and Q, it's like when uh, when filmmakers can no longer watch film anymore because they're just analyzing the whole thing. I think it's like very similar uh, thinking. Um, on a lighter note, uh, does anyone have any their most memorable moment in an Inside Out class? I can I can jump in because I think mine happened last week. Um, probably, uh, we had probably two of the best speakers. I wish they could have spoke to like me for like days on days on days, just because they uh, have so much knowledge. Um, but like the first was, uh, we, we invited the, um, the Pitzer Distinguished Alumni Award, uh, winner, uh, Romerilyn Ralston, um, to come speak to us. Um, and so she's working at like California. University of Fullerton in a program that's like uh, kind of similar to Inside Out, but like more focused on once um, folks um, have exited the carceral state and like are now like formally incarcerated and living on the outside, like how to help them uh, get their degree um, and pursue higher education. And so uh, she's the director of that. She went to Pitzer um, and she just also like talked to us a lot about like incarceration and like how we can like push for like better change and like she she said because we we asked her about like you know like how do i deal with like reform versus abolition which was like one thing that like i constantly like run through my head um it's like how do you deal with that but like she she had this really great quote where she's like you know like reform and like i'm not quoting her word for word but but like basically like reform like 
even though like you might be pushing for like abolition in the end like reforms like a stepping stone that like you can use to like help improve like the quality of life for people like as they currently live you know like or like as they currently are in the system that we have set up but like abolition is like the end goal and that's something that like you constantly have in mind and like every single step that you take whether that might be something that's more of a, like a reform or more of like an abolitionist approach like that's something that you're constantly working to um and so that was just one thing that i thought was um really nice to have her like speak about and like talk about and just also like it was really nice to like hear from like a pitzer alumni i find like it's always really nice to have um have like Pitzer alumni come back and speak in classes. And then we also had uh, Renford Reese, who's like, he works over at um, Cal Poly Pomona. Um, and he uh, has like um, the prison education program, uh, PEP it's called. And he's just such a smart like person. If you have the opportunity to ever like talk to him or like read his work, please do that. Um, he's really like such a fountain of knowledge. Like I was just sitting there like, staring just like amazed um and so definitely like really just go to a talk like if you can find a youtube video of him speaking just just watch that like uh truly studying like i i cannot like i'm getting like excited like talking about him because he he is such a, a smart academic such a kind person just and his his wisdom like every single word he said i was like this is amazing like this is this is what i want in like a college professor not saying that you should go to like Cal Poly Pomona, come to Pitzer, but uh, he was just so smart in like everything that he said. I was just in awe. Like I'm still in awe, like looking back on it, it's been like almost a week now. I think I'll, I will be brief. I was trying to think um, about a moment in particular, and it's kind of hard because I, like I said, it was my favorite class that I took. Um, and I, so the course was called Political Economy of Food. And I think, one of the most like memorable moments, special moments for me was that um, every like every two weeks, not at the end of every week, but every two weeks we got to um, just kind of spend some reflective time by ourselves. Like our professor would give us a, a blank sheet of paper and just have us kind of write down something um, important, whether that was like a moment or a memory you have related to food. Um, Cause the whole course was, was talking about um, our, our food system from ranging from production to consumption um, and just the, the many layers of um, injustices that are involved um, in our food system and inequalities and um, kind of just, just the complexities of everything that goes into what we eat at the grocery store um, and or what we don't eat at the grocery store. Um, and so, so this moment was a time like away from all the scholarly literature, away from the newspaper articles, just you and your paper and writing down, you know, how has food been important to you in the last week? Or what's a memory you, you think of when you think of food significance to you? Um, and then we would like share out what we thought. And that was just it was really powerful for me because as someone who um, food is an important cultural um, and just a, a personal thing in my life um, and to get to listen to everybody else's experience and think about again think about this like academic topic in a really personal way and then be able to connect that to academia um, was really cool and, and has been something it's not limited to my experience in the inside out program I've had other personal experiences like that at Pitzer um, but I think the inside out program lends itself really well to those kinds of experiences. I have a question here from the audience. Um, I th think this might be one of our last questions, but how does Pitzer or even the five C's at large challenge or play into ideological polar polarization? I know it's late on a Tuesday. I'm <laughs> actually taking. Oh. I'm taking a okay. seminar right now, Pomona, about political polarization, um, which is really interesting. And it's given me a lot of new frameworks to understand it. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's necessarily like a, hmm, a very clear answer, but I do think that uh, no matter what, like people I by and large at Pitzer want to engage in discussion. Um, and I think maybe that is one of the things most driving political polarization is like fear of discussion and um, fear of like 
I don't know the other side. And I feel like generally one thing that I have really appreciated at Pitzer is like coming to conversations with um, like your identity present, but your ego away from it. Like people coming to like learn and talk and hear people's perspectives. And I think like, you know, Pitzer is like any other college at this point. <laughs> it's like the, we are not like these special things that exist outside of the world that we're in. Like all the problems that exist <laughs> in the U S like obviously exist at Pitzer. That's like, that's granted. That's a given. That's I think the same for most universities. Um, but I also do think that most people do want to have the conversation and it's not like a thing of, oh, let me prove to you why you're wrong and I'm right. But instead, like, how about we come together and learn together, uh, which I think is special. Yeah, this is actually what I always say brought me to Pitzer um, was that folks are not afraid to engage in conversation and that everyone is like constantly pushing each other to be better community members. Um, and I think that, you know, Pitzer draws a lot of folks who, well, Pitzer draws all folks who care about the core values in some way, shape or form. Um, but the way that that somebody cares about what one person cares about the core values it looks very different from how another person cares about the core values based on you know identity where they were raised different background just all all of those things the context um in which they learned about the values um and so i think that that you you get a community of um, folks who are really passionate about these values and who are really passionate about um, the the things they've experienced in their lives and they want to talk about it and they want to share it with each other. And so I think like for me, one of the things that I am I think most grateful for, for my experience at Pitzer is how often folks have been willing to push me <laughs> and say, no, you actually don't know everything. <laughs> you, you've spent a lot of time in, in class and you've done a lot of reading and you're very smart, but <laughs> there's some things that you don't know. There's some experiences that you don't, you've never had. There's these perspectives that you forgot and you've, you know, you've read all these things and you've tried really hard to, to listen and learn, but you can't ever stop that. Like you, if you think you're done, you're not done. Um, and I'm really grateful for folks who like take the time out of their day to remind me, you know, hey, actually, here's here's how you can include this perspective to make your analysis of this even better. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think that Pitcher does a nice job of, of challenging, I guess is my answer, challenging um, polarization in that way. like as a small part to add because like you saying all that just remind me of one thing um Kayla and that I think our new resources program in which like students who are traditionally older than like the uh I guess then older than the traditional college student have the uh opportunity to take classes at Pitzer and I personally feel like there's also just a generational difference that can lead to polarization and like the ways that we choose to communicate our ideas and our beliefs um and I've definitely had that moment of like people like I I um have had a class and an internship with one woman who spoke about like how she really, she feels like this experience of hers is um, symbolic in like a lot of other relationships, but she doesn't like the word like privilege. And in turn, she like really identifies with the word access and like thinking about things in terms of access, just because she felt like, oh, it feels so terrible to be at this school when everyone's like naming their privileges. And it's like, it makes me really cognizant of everything I don't have. Um, so just like those conversations where you are like <laughs> taken into someone else's shoes and like in that sense, the generational shoes, which I think is also related to polarization um, and it's just been really valuable, so. Yeah, any last advice or thoughts about racial justice initiative or the inside out program at Pitzer for students? Why, um, why did you decide on, um, if you, let's rephrase the question. If you were to be applying for college again um, and now knowing what you know about Pitzer and our social responsibility core value, um, what advice would you, do you have or would you do it all again? I can, I can jump in because like, I was just thinking like, personally, like I didn't look that much into like, like 
uh, educational requirements before I came here. So I didn't know we had to take a, a social responsibility practice course um, or like uh, they even had inside out classes or anything like that. Uh, but all I'm gonna say is like, if I knew that they had this, I probably would have applied like ED because I applied like regular decision. And I probably, if I still applied like regular decision, I would have said yes a lot quicker. Um, Cause like I delayed like all the way to like the May 1st. I was like, I'm gonna be that person that like waits to the very end until I like decide. I, the decision would have been like much sooner, I think for me. Um, just knowing like how, like I think Pitzer does all of their social practice and like inside out and all these programs that they have really intentionally they think a lot before they do them, especially now being on like the student senate side also where like I was part of like the work that like went into like making sure that like the the BA program passed, you know, and like making sure that like it had everything fleshed out, seeing how much like thought went into that and like how much just behind the scene work has happened for like these different programs and everything. I think it shows me that like pits are really doesn't just jump into something and is like, here's this program to help support people. It's like, no, we're really gonna go in, like work through it that like we're doing it to the best of our ability and then launch them. And and I think like if I knew that and had seen that, I probably would have said yes to Pitzer way quicker and have worked a lot, lot harder to get in here sooner. Um but uh that's probably all I have. I have a story, so I'll actually add it in, like, if I would have known this about Pitzer before I would have came, I mean, I ED'd anyway, so, like, regardless, I would be here, um, nothing would have made the process faster, because I ED'd, however, I will say, um, it's certain things that you can do at Pitzer that you really just can't do at other colleges or university, and it just made me think about organization me and five other, like, first-generation low-income um, students started called Nobody Fails at Pitzer. And so basically when COVID-19 first hit, Pitzer implemented like an opt-in grading policy where you can choose a traditional grading policy or you can opt into like a pass as um, no credit or whatever. And so we're like, no, that's wrong because we know the privileged students are gonna be the students that can afford to, to opt in into the traditional grading scale. And like students that are exper experiencing housing insecurity um, and like, people, students who would literally just have to go home and start back working for their families, like they would be forced to do the past has no credit system. So it was like, you say it's opt-in, but it's really not opt-in. You're just forcing students to choose. And it was just like, you can just see like the inequities within that. So we basically worked that to demand that Pitzer implement like a universal aid policy. We like typed up templates for students and faculty to send to like the president and everything. And we was able to like give our statement at like a faculty executive meeting and our policy was passed. And so basically like everybody at Pitzer got an A in spring 2020. And it's just like, you cannot do that. And no, at just any type of university would look at you and be like, oh no, we already came up with our grading policy. We're not even gonna have this conversation with you. But literally six students was able to change like a whole institutional grading policy. So if I would have known that before I came to, well, I mean, I can't really answer that question because I was coming to Pitzer regardless because I ED, but it would have just made me even happier to ED, I would say. And so, yeah, so many unique experiences that you can do, so many unique things you could do at Pitzer in terms of just changing anything that you don't like, you can do it. Um, and so, yeah. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today and to share your experience on the Racial Justice Initiative and the Inside Out program, I think. I've definitely learned a lot um, and we'll definitely be having follow-up conversations with all of you. I think it's so much fun. Um, and for our seniors as well, who have done it for four years um, and for our uh, sophomores who have two more years to con continue to change the atmosphere at Pitzer. Um, have a good night and we'll see you all soon. And for those who are still in our session, um, Olivia just dropped the link in the chat uh, for you to learn more about Pitzer. Well...